Hey, I'm Nathan Tabor with Handling Life. Thank you for joining us today. I'm uh, really honored to have uh, not only a friend, uh, but my Vic, which is my broker in charge at Realty One Group, uh, Teresa Overcash, with us today. And Teresa, thanks for taking the time. Uh, I know you've got um, all this free time on your hands that everybody thinks just because you're quarantined, but that's not the case, right? <laughs> Work still goes on. That's correct. And thank you for having me. So tell me a little bit about yourself, because I know you've been in real estate and you've won some awards and you're, um, you and your husband run Realty One Group. So tell me a little bit just background wise. Okay. Well, I started in real estate um, in October of 1996, and I actually was at NC State University, and I had graduated from UNC Greensboro, and I was doing some postgraduate work at NC State, and I was working towards getting into pharmacy school. And um, so I had just gotten accepted into the biological engineering program at NC State when uh, my husband and I found out that we were expecting. And so I thought, you know, I'm just going to, well, actually, my mom called and she was like, look, I own a real estate company in Wilkes, you're in Raleigh, um, you're getting ready to have a baby, <clears throat> that's going to be our first grandchild, why don't you put the, um, put the pharmacy thing on hold and just come home and do some work in real estate with me? <laughs> and I was like, yeah, that sounds good. So we packed up and we moved and I started doing real estate part-time because um, none of the agents wanted to take floor duty on the weekends. And so I just did the floor duty on the weekends, which was what nobody else wanted. And I, apparently they were missing a big opportunity because I built my first business in real estate from taking the leftovers <laughs> nobody else wanted. And so um, when they started seeing that I was getting a lot of listings and a lot of sales, suddenly the weekend floor duty became very popular. And so then everybody wanted the weekend floor duty. So I kind of started working a little more and a little more. And before I knew it, I got into it full time. And so it's been, I guess, going on 24 years now. Um, I was with my mom's company for 21 years and then decided to go out on my own and have been um, an owner of Realty One Group since 2000, the end of 2017, the beginning of 2018. That's awesome. That's awesome. You have how, how many agents now? We have 130 agents that have joined us since, since about March of 2018. That's awesome. That's yeah. a, a great number there. Um, yeah, it so, is. So one of the um, couple of things that jumped out there when you're kind of giving your, your intro, of course, this podcast is geared towards, you know, real life, you know, right. everything that goes on, but then how do we as Christians, how do we as people of faith integrate that? Right. And so you're, you're on a path, you have your plan. You're right. going to go to biotech. You're going to go do this. Right. And then you, you get pregnant and I'm mm -hmm. sure somewhere in there, there was some stress or some anxiety <laughs> of, Oh, well, but I wanted to do this. <laughs> Yes. Yes, there was. Um, there was a lot of stress with that. But, you know, I was 28, 29 years old when that happened. And so I was still young and felt invincible then. And I was, it was easy for me to pivot back then because I was young and broke. And, you know, it was just, okay, we'll try this. You know, what really was the shocker for me and what really tested my faith was um, after 21 years of working for my mom, I had assumed that since it was a family business and she owned it, that I would be working into partial ownership of that family business. Um, after 21 years of listing and selling and doing a lot of administrative work and some training and things like that for the company sort of approached my mom and I was like, you know, I'm getting a little bit burned out with just listing and selling all the time and doing the administrative work all the time. 
um, and I'm still on commission only. So I want to move up into a more of an administrative role or some type of partial ownership role so that I can use my knowledge to make money off of my knowledge and training and coaching instead of the listing and selling aspect. And my mom said, this is my company. And um, if you want to have any sort of administrative role, you need to open up your own company. So that was a real shock to me because had I known that or had I had the smarts to ask that question <laughs> prior to 21 years of 70 hour work weeks, um, I would have gotten that answer sooner. I just assumed and uh, everybody else assumed too. So it was kind of a, you know, a shock. So I said, well, okay, then I guess at 50 years old, I'll take a look at opening up my own company. I really did not want to start over because I had worked so hard and given my goodness, what felt like more than I should have given or could have given for many, many times. Um, I was also raising three children and um, my husband was a highway patrolman and he worked nights. So he would sleep during the day. So all of the kid stuff, of getting everybody up and ready for school and um, all that stuff was on me and getting up during the night as needed with the children was on me. And then I would go to work during the day and then when I would come home at night, he would be gone to work. So the bath, the dinner, the homework, all of that was on me. So, you know, that was definitely burning the candle at both ends. Um, but I felt like I was building a business. And so it felt like something that you had to do. So I was shocked when she told me that. Um, so I went out, started researching um, franchises because I felt like independent brokerages were not going to survive in the technology era. Um, and so I went back to her and I was like, okay, well, I'm researching some franchises and I'm thinking, thinking about buying a Realty One group. And she said, well, you have my blessing. This will be a real eye opener for you. So I called her back a couple weeks later and I was like, okay, I'm going to fly to California. I'm going to sign the paperwork. What that meant to me was I'm like, I'm leaving. I'm going. If there's You're anything. Hoping, I'm going hoping to she's going to stop you. <laughs> Say, hey, wait, before yeah, you go. I, I know. I'm leaving. I'm going. Anything you want to say, anything you want to do, any change of heart. And she was like, you have my blessing. And so I was like, okay, well, I'm just going to, I'm going to go for it. And Kirk, my husband and I jumped on a plane, flew out to California, signed all the paperwork, came back. Um, and she said, um, I've changed my mind. I want you to come back. And I said, mom, I can't do that. I've already bought a franchise. This has been taking two and three months of planning. I've kept you abreast along the way of everything. It's not, there's no turning back now. So why don't you come with me and we'll partner in this new venture together? And at first she said, okay. But then a few days later, she said, you know, this concept of the 100% commission, there's not enough meat on the bone in that concept for there to be multiple partners. So I'm not going to do it. So she stayed with her company. I moved forward with Realty One Group. But what really tested my faith was when she said, if you move forward with this, I no longer want to have a relationship with you. She said, I love you. You're my daughter, but I have no desire to have a relationship with you. You're now the enemy. And so I was really shocked by that because uh, I said to her, well, my sister is not a real estate agent. And y'all have plenty of things to talk about um, that are non-work related. So why can't we just have that relationship? And she said, that's not how it works. She said, you either are with me or you're against me. And if you're a competitor, you're against me. So I have no desire to have a relationship with you. And there's no need for us to, to continue to communicate. So from that point forward, there's just not been a relationship. I've reached out several times. Um, and she's like, I'm done. I'll never get over this. I'll never forgive you for this. Move on. We have no relationship. So that was very trying for me. And um, my sister, who is a pediatrician in um, Winston-Salem, she told us, she was like, you guys need to go to counseling. 
And so we set up counseling and then my mom canceled and she was like, I don't need counseling. Um, I don't want to resolve this relationship and it's over. So um, at first, you know, I had, I really didn't know how that was going to impact me because it was such a shock. You know, this is my mother who I've worked with every day for 21 years. I have her three grandchildren um, that she's very close to. Um, what's up with this? I just couldn't wrap my mind around taking that stance with any of my children. Did, but, did she cut off relationship with the grandkids as well? No, no. And neither did I. I have continued to allow the kids to have a very loving relationship with her because I feel like my kids love their grandmother very much. And I feel like she loves them very much. And I don't want my kids to suffer from this. So I have there was a part of me, you know, I had the devil on one shoulder and the angel on the other. And the devil yep. was saying, <clears throat> punish her with the kids because that would kill my mom to not have a relationship with her grandchildren. But the angel was like, that's not from God. You know, that's not coming from God. You do what's best for your kids and you follow through in love with what you do. And God sort of told me, I got this. You just walk in love and walk in faith. I'm working behind the scenes. Just, it's okay. But it took me a while to get to that point. There were a lot of tears. There, you know, was a lot of sleepless nights, um, depression, anger, irritability, agitation, all that stuff. And then finally, you know, God led me into the acceptance part of that. And so that's where I am now. And every once in a while, I just reach out say, my arms are open. I love you. I miss you. I'm here if you change your mind, but I'm able to, to compartmentalize that pain and put it on a shelf and function normally and love others and not put a wall up and all that stuff. So that was where my faith, one of the ways that my faith was tested in this whole real estate thing. So, uh, you know, as of today, we still don't talk and I'm two years in and there's no more visits, no more phone calls. She won't take my calls. She won't reply to my text messages. Um, that's where we are. Well, so I'm so sorry. Uh, um, I'm still, uh, real quick, I want to get done because that's a very, you know, thing on that. I'm still getting a little bit of feedback. Do you happen to have a Bluetooth you can connect to your computer see. or a uh, even a corded, you have a little earbud? Um, it doesn't do it the whole time. It just does it right when I start out. I don't know if you hit it on your end, but it's a, it's a little bit of a growl, a uh, uh, higher pitch. I don't want to hurt somebody's. Uh, um, I'm looking Bluetooth. It says my Bluetooth is on. What am I trying to connect to? Oh, so do you have an earbud? Um, do you do you use an ear? Um, I don't. Talking? Okay, that's I okay. Um, I have one at work. <laughs> Oh, that's okay. Quarantined. <laughs> yeah, that's all right. So we'll we'll we'll, we'll go through that. We'll, I'll just when I start out, I'll I'll be slower on it because uh, once I get to talking, it doesn't do it. It's like the okay. initial. Well, you know, <clears throat> thank you for for opening up on that. That is a sure. um, a subject of of family conflict in business or in life. Um, I've had a a ton of that in my life from a family business, and when I was going through it, um, there's this hurt there's this anger there's the frustration of or why do they want to you know why don't they want anything to do with me but they mm -hmm. want you know they do stuff with others um you kind of this roller coaster of emotion, what did i do you mm -hmm. get this blame of making it, it feel like it's all your fault it's all what you right. did mm -hmm. um especially then when you're christians and they say well you know i'm a christian you're a christian but then they don't want to get together they don't want to meet with anyone and it can really uh, throw you for a loop it can right. and bitterness and anger um of kind of that you know well if if she's going to do that or if they're going to do that i'm going to do this so if she's right. not going to talk to me i'm going to withhold the grandkids right and for the longest time i felt like i was the only person who was going through that right like like i couldn't tell anybody about it because right. and i know your heart it's not that you're or i that i'm trying to embarrass any of my family or i'm trying to you know tell my side so they can't tell theirs or any right. of that 
but more of sharing my testimony of sharing my story of this is what I went through and my right. I got bitter for I mean deep for you know 10 or more years where yes. it was just really you know um, not I never I never spoke about it but internally right. it was like I'm going to do this to prove this wrong right or to to show that I can do this and so my my focus became money and growing my business and right. you know being on the stage and getting the award so right. I could say look I can do this right and anytime we do that what do we do we take God out of right where you should be. So if you say, well, I'm going to withhold my kids. Well, right. and you made the point, that's not what God wants. That's not how God right. wants us to handle it. Right. Well, I'm going to go show them. I can, I can grow my business or I'm going to go show them. I can get this degree or I'm going to go show whatever it is. You've put yourself in front of God. Right. And it sounds like I you've know. had a, a pretty good grasp on getting that under control kind of from day one, but most don't. So con well, <laughs> congratulations on that. And I'm not, I'm not saying, I'm sure you've had some heartbreak over this. I mean, that's your mother. Yes. Yes, I have. Yeah, you absolutely. Know? And I was very close to her, you know, because we worked together every day and would talk after hours. And anytime she wanted to hire someone or fire someone, I was always a part of all of that. Um, so it was just, you know, completely ripped out of my life at, just and I, I wasn't even expecting it because on one side it was you have my blessing but then I'm not exactly sure what happened in her mind <laughs> but she changed her mind yeah you know we could <laughs> speculate on that and go down through but um we don't know god knows right. but i'd like to know from you to encourage others so you know you find yourself on this path you're doing you know what God wants you to do, you're, you're behaving correctly. I'm sure your mom and y'all had some arguments here and there because nobody's perfect, but I mean, right. you were honoring her. You, so whether you're a business partner or family, what are a couple of things that you found in your life that helped you deal with that anger, frustration, bitter, you know, all the adjectives that we want to throw in there, emotions, and I'm sure still at times, we, if you were to think about this, sometimes it's like, well, I'm going to drive up to Wilkes County, <laughs> go knock on her door <laughs> and show her some not so kind Southern hospitality. <laughs> right. Um, you don't have to admit to it, but I know you because oh, we're I'm, human. I'm telling you, I, um, because there's no peace there. And I found that there is some human relief there from um, emptying that negativity out. But momentary, there's not, momentary yes, human relief. Yeah. Right. <clears throat> but there's not, there, there is no peace there. And so um, I have had a relationship with God since I was very small. And um he has revealed himself to me in many ways. And so I have a, I have a, what I call a strong ear, one strong ear that I feel um, that God sort of guides me through. And what I mean by that is um, before this ever happened with my mom, I started having dreams about being on a plane going to California. And I, I don't fly unless I absolutely have to because I'm terrified of flying. Um, and I was by myself on this plane going to California. And I kept, you know, the first time I had it, I probably didn't even think anything about it. But then I started noticing that that, that dream had a different feel to it. Um, when I would wake up, it's hard to explain. But that dream had a different feel to it in my dreams. And so even though I had no idea what it meant, um, I remembered it. And so sure enough, when I signed the paperwork, guess where they fly you out to sign to California. So, um, you know, I said to my husband, I said, but I was by myself on that plane and I was looking across the aisle over the top of someone's head, standing up, looking out the window of the plane. And I was by myself and he said, because you were going out on your own. 
because when he was on the plane ride with me, I was like, well, something's wrong with this plane ride because I was by myself and you're with me. <laughs> I was in the seat. I was in that seat yeah. where I was looking over and I could see over someone's head out the window. It was the same view. And I was headed to California. And I was like, but I was by myself. And he was like, no, you were just going out on your own. And you are going out on your own from your mom. So that's what that meant. And um, there have been other things that God has shown me that I don't know what they mean. But then as I go through my life and follow a path, it reveals itself to me. And it seems very random, but it's just God's way of saying, you're on the right path. I was here ahead of you. It's okay. Um, even to that's a certain a time, age, That's a time that can be overwhelming, right? That can be, you know, even though, even, the, you know, at times when I know exactly where God wants me to go, I know I'm here at A and he wants me at Z, mm -hmm. but I don't know the steps. I don't know the rest of the alphabet in between that. Sometimes it's yes. like, you know, yes, God, I know that's where you want me to go. Right. But that's, I mean, how do I get there? How, <laughs> you know, how do I link it all together? Yes. And, and that is exactly how I felt because I'm like, okay, well, what else is there? I need to see more. You know, you can't just show me things and I don't know how to get there. But I, what I feel God says to me is just rest, pray, help others, love and rest. Keep doing what you're doing. You think that there's a heavy burden that's got to get you from A to Z, but there's not. There is rest and love and doing for others and doing your thing. You know, go to your appointments, meet the people you're supposed to meet. These might be divine appointments that God has set up for you that you might think might be a waste of your time. Just like the day you and I talked about the commercial director position. Neither one of us knew what we were <laughs> meeting yeah, where, about. Where, where is it leading, right? Right. And so um, you just sort of have to step out in faith and pray. and. Um, Go about your day doing the best you can and doing all you can with your God-given talents, and you'll find yourself there. And I've had to learn a lot of patience because I, I need to know what's ahead of me so that I can prepare. But, but then God says, you're already prepared. <laughs> Just go. And so I have finally quit fighting it. <laughs> So I just, I just go and I do, and, and that's, that's how I've made it so far. You know, that, that saying that uh, daily, that is in the patience I found in my own life. When I um, start to try to plan, you know, what's going to happen next week? How am I going to do this? How am I going to do that? And I, I start building the blocks to where I'm, I'm so far out there. I, I'm, you know, the blocks are, yes. are, are wavering back and forth. <laughs> And then I go back to God's word and he says, you know, today, mm -hmm. your life is like a vapor and manna for today. You focus on today. You right. focus, take up your cross daily. Right. Right. So how did, did, when you were going through the relationships, you know, issues with your mom and, and going to California and, and doing this, do you find comfort in sticking to the day? I mean, you got to plan out. Yeah. You, you plan right. the future, but right. focus on the day. Yes, I, I do take comfort in that. Um, I have gotten to the point that I I will make a basic plan, but I know that um, that God might have something different planned for me. So I have learned to be very flexible. And I don't know, I have just, from what I've been through um, when I was married before, my previous husband was, I was in an abusive relationship for 13 years and he was abusive and he was an alcoholic and that was very difficult. Then I went through the thing with my mom. Um, I have a son who's in rehab right now. So I've had several things happen to me in my life that have just absolutely broken me to the point that all I had was God. And that's when he showed me that that was all I needed. So I have been beaten up and fought back enough to see that um, God's got me. It's almost like I've been through enough. I've been through enough and so much that I'm on the other end of that now where I'm like, I get it. He has shown me that if I will just focus on him and listen to him, 
that he will transport me through all of these terrible things that happen. I've learned to make better choices. I've learned to make better decisions. I've learned um, a lot of what my contributions to my own problems are. I am the common denominator in all of my problems as well. So I, I have learned how to make better choices and better decisions. I have learned that um, I shouldn't be making rash decisions. I need to pull back and pray and make sure that I feel guided to those decisions. But I have learned that this life has stuff in it that is so much greater than what my human mind and my human spirit and my human body can withstand and handle. It would have crushed me to ashes by now had I tried to make it on my own. So the only reason I still have a genuine smile and a genuine love to help people through all of that is because I finally realized that if I would just lean on God, he would transport me through just like a, a, a vapor through walls. And if you try to go through walls as a human, you run in and fall back. And you'll keep running into him until you beat yourself up and break every bone you've got. That's how I tried to handle it in the beginning. And then when I finally gave it up to God, I felt him moving me through those walls, through my spirit, instead of with my human body. So when I find that I'm broken to pieces, I realize it's because I've been running into the wall as a human again. And then when I give no, it up to God, he moves me through. I like that analogy oh, there. And, and sometimes I think of it as, you know, I, I keep running into that wall because that's where I want to go. And God's like, hey, dummy, if you'll turn around and look the other way, there's a whole paradise behind you. <laughs> right. You know, right. you talked about making that right choice at any time. Um, and I try to simplify my relationship with God because it's not comp I complicated, but from God's right. stance, it's either obey God or disobey God. Right. It's love your mother and forgive her and be patient with her and pray for her and all the things that God says to do in his word. So obey him or disobey. So you're going to listen right. to the, the, the angel or the devil mm -hmm. and that you're either going to serve God or serve your flesh. You know, right. Jesus says we can't serve two masters. I can't serve God and I can't serve flesh at the same time. Right. So when you say on there making those right choices, mm -hmm. We do. That's what God has asked us to do is to make that choice. Right. As you said, we can keep running into that wall, right? We can just keep <laughs> causing ourselves pain yeah. after pain after pain because yeah. of our own choices, or we can choose to do it God's way. Right. Absolutely. You're, you're absolutely right. And I have run and into the wall many it times. Simplified. It simplifies the relationship, right? With God. It does. It does. And when you... If it's complicated, then it's, it's not from God because God created us. So he knows our limitations. And I had, I had to recognize my limitations. God already knew them, but I, um, sometimes I overestimate myself <laughs> and I think I can handle that. But, you know, I could not, I could not have gotten to where I am today and still love people and want to help people and still be able to find real joy in each day and, and um, sincere joy unless I would have given it to God. Because the human body, when it gets to certain parts, the only emotions you have when you've been pushed as far as you can go in your human form, you find anger and resentment and retaliation and pride and ego. And all of those things will not lead you to joy and peace in God. So it's when you finally have exhausted those emotions and what you reach to, you realize that's when you have to reach over. You, you get to a mindset. Mind. Yes, you so, do. You know, I, I used to say, I, I want to be happy. Mm -hmm. I, I want to do things. I want to make money, grow my business. So I can be happy. About the age of 40, I started to realize happiness is an emotion it comes right. and goes i can be happy right. till somebody rear ends me right and i have to have neck surgery right but being or being angry or um that that's a being angry or having joy is a choice right 
happiness is an emotion. So right. the mindset, I can choose and you can choose to be joyful, no matter what right. happens. Right. The deal falls exactly. apart. The, the, the deal goes sideways or whatever. I'm going to choose to find right. what, what's God's silver lining here. Right. Absolutely. I agree. And, and, you know, I used to be the same way. I used to be like, what will make me happy? And now I sort of think it's not really possible for me to be happy as long as there are people suffering within my reach that I could help. Um, but I can be joyful as I reach out to help them and as I try to make a difference every day. And I'm no longer seeking happiness because to me that there's almost a selfish feeling in happiness. And that's why for me, I don't think it's possible for me to be happy as far as I can't ignore the people around the children that are starving and the people that are abused and the kids that don't have meals. I live in a very rural town. And to me, as long as those people are in need, I shouldn't be seeking a happiness. Um, I should be seeking a duty to take care of those people and an acknowledgement that they exist. Um, but I can choose to be joyful and loving and giving along the way. And that's just sort of how things work in my mind. And everybody sort of has their own way of looking at things. But that's, that's why each day the things that happen don't determine whether I'm joyful or not, because I can find something every day bad that would make me unhappy, but I can also find something good every day that would make me joyful. So I choose to work hard on making a difference, but I'm not going to let that take my joy because you can't draw people to God and you can't draw people to Jesus through anger and judgmental words and harshness and unkindness. How you can draw people to God is joyful and, and remaining joyful through your trials and tribulations. And people will say, wow, she's been to hell and back and she's still happy and loving and so kind to me. How do you do that? And that's I mean, how people want to be closer to God. Um, because you they look at your rap sheet here. <laughs> you know, a, abusive husband, son in rehab, a mother who won't. Would you know right. would talk with you after you did what she said you should do and right. and all of this? It, it, why shouldn't you be mad at God? Why shouldn't you be mad at the world? Well, you know, I got I got dealt a bum hand here. You know, um, and and that is an attitude that a lot of you know non Christians, but a lot of attitude that that Christians have. They're right. saved. They're going to heaven, but it's like, oh, woe is me. What do you mean, no oh, woe is you? Right. You got a mansion for you in heaven. What kind of right. example are you? Why exactly. would somebody want to come work for Realty One Group if all you ever talked about is, oh, well, you know, our brokers, we don't ever sell, you know, we don't ever really right. sell anything. And, right. and you just gave them this laundry list of how horrible of a company you are. Why <laughs> right. would anybody want to come work for you? Right. Absolutely. No, you I tell know. them what's going right in your, yeah. Are there bad right. things in your company? Yes, but there's bad things in every company. Exactly. Exactly. Are there great things in your company? Absolutely. So, right. you know, as Christians, we need to start telling people like, especially now with all that's going on in the world with the coronavirus and that, mm -hmm. what's the good things? Right. I'm not in the hospital. I'm not right. struggling with cancer. Right. I, my daughter's healthy. My right. wife and I have been making this list of what we're blessed for because right. it'd be very easy to turn in and go, oh, her travel business is 100% gone. She's had to cancel right. every trip. Right. Absolutely. My consulting business, my small business consulting is gone. I mean, right. how can I consult with somebody who's had to close their doors and, right. you know, right. So it's, there's a lot that I could turn to and say, well, God, you know, what is up here? Right. But what, what good is that going to do? Right. I, I agree. And, and I look at, you know, the stuff I've been through that wasn't, I don't feel like that was God. That was me making bad decisions. God just brought me through it and has enabled me to turn that into something that can glorify him. Um, so I also know that I'm a rebel Christian. 
and that means that I well, have we to all, work we hard. all are if we're honest about it. <laughs> I have to work hard sometimes because I feel you know sometimes I feel my human nature creeping up on me and I recognize it and sometimes I give into it and later I'm like oh you failed again but you know people say to me you're still working and you're still doing this um you're going to get coronavirus and I I don't know my relationship with God has put me in a situation where I don't walk around in fear you know people are like what if you lose everything from this coronavirus well you know what I've learned God will get me through that too. And I'll use that suffering to glorify him. And what well, if you- can I'm going to be smart about yourself? what I'm doing. And I know right. you're being smart about what I'm not going to go out and, you know, hang out on the beach with 500 people and, right. and dance around yeah. like they are doing. When yeah. I go to the grocery store to get some things, you know, I'm, right. I'm, I'm watching right. who's around and, right. and my wife and daughter haven't been out. We actually went to an antique store. We we're like, nobody would be at an antique store. And there wasn't. So we walked in and <laughs> we had the whole place to ourselves except the two people working there. Probably the safest so being, place in the world. <laughs> yeah. We're being wise as serpents, right? Yes. We're, we're being yes. wise about what we're doing. Yes. But at the same time, I, you know, if I get coronavirus, I don't think God would be punishing me. Right. Because right. there's a lot of good Christians out there who have gotten coronavirus. There's probably, I don't know any, but I'm sure there are Christians who've gotten coronavirus who have died. Right. All Absolutely. I know is when, when things happen to us in our lives, like the Job things where we don't, mm -hmm. you know, we're do we're being wise, we're living for God and things come in yeah. is during that time, the only two things I know for sure is we're still supposed to love others and we're supposed to share right. the gospel. That's exactly right. And as you know, you may have seen on social media with um, Realty One Group, we've put together um, a group of volunteers. And if people need us to go pick up their meds and deliver it to their porch or to make them a hot meal and deliver it to their porch or go pick them up fast food um, or take out and deliver it to their porch or go grocery shopping for them and bring it to their porch, we're doing that free of charge. I mean, they're paying they're paying for the items they're, yeah, they're getting, for their stuff, yeah. right? But the delivery we're not charging for. Um, but we do tell them, you know, do not come out and take this from us. We're going to put it on your porch, you know, because we're trying to um, respect the non-contact, not only for them, but for us and our families as well. And that's when, you know, I was told, well, you're going to get coronavirus. And I'm like, you know what? I'm trying very, very, very hard not to. Um, I'm being very cautious. But if I end up getting it anyway, I'm, a, I'm not in fear of it. Do I want it? No. Do I hope, you know, I'm def desperately hoping I don't get it, but I'm not going to let it cause me to lead in fear. I'm not going to let it cause me to wake up in fear, to go out in fear, and to go to bed in fear. I refuse to lead by fear. And that's where I'm um, leading with faith. And I know God gave me a brain. And he wants me to use it. And so I try every day to do the, th to, to use the capabilities of my brain power to make smart decisions in everything that I do, but still things are going to happen. And I lead with faith, knowing that in spite of all of the brain power I've used to be cautious and to make good decisions, if I still find myself in a very bad situation, I know from my past experience that God will get me through it. And if it's painful, that just means there's a great testimony coming from it. And if I just keep my thoughts in that direction, it gives me the strength to make it through things that before I had my mindset of this, I couldn't, I wouldn't have had the courage to go through the things I go through now because I would have thought it'll kill me. It'll break me. It'll make me depressed. It'll make me anxious. It'll make me this. Well, I don't know about you, but I get into the, uh, the what if. Well, what if? What if I do this and this happens? What if? And you almost get to the point where if you start down that line, then you just don't do anything because the what ifs take over. Right. Well, I mean, I, I called my neighbors. They're, I called two neighbors today. They're both over the age of 80 and said, hey, I'm going to go to the grocery store in a little bit. Do you all need anything? And they have family closest, you know, 30, 40 minutes away. Right. And uh, one was like, no, we're good. And one was like, oh, yes, I'd love, you know, I, I need some uh, half gallon of milk and I, you right. know, just a few little things. And I was like, well, hey, just put your money on the porch. And I'll come by right. and pick it up and then I'll, I'll, I'll right. call you when I, when I go later this afternoon. Yeah. And um, why not? 
Right. Why not? You know, what, what if I go to the grocery store, but you know what? I've gotten Amazon boxes and I've gotten mail and there's other things that, I mean, I'm, if I get it, I can say, oh, I was great. Well, man, I might not. It could, you know, right. it, there's too many what ifs in that. And there's right. in, in the overall scheme then of, of serving God, you know, what if you drop your pride and what if you drop the bitterness and you love your mother and you pray for her? And right. you don't make it about you. Right. But if you go with the what if, then you're going to open up the bitterness and you're going to open up. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I don't understand why God asks us to do things. Mm -hmm. And for a number of years in my life, I struggled with, is it okay to ask God about something or question God? Mm -hmm. And the Lord led me to um, uh, Jesus in the garden of Gethsemane a number of years ago where Jesus asked God, Hey, if you have someone else that can do this, mm -hmm three times, send them on down. I'm, you know, right. peace out. I'll, I'm good. But he didn't stay there questioning God. Once right. he knew that's where, that's what God wanted. He went and did it. Right. And I find myself at times struggling where, you know, what if, what if, or oh God, you can you do this coming. And I know I need to go here, but I don't want to. Right. Oh yeah. Absolutely. And the longer we wait, the longer we don't do it God's way, the just the more consequences, the more heartache, the more bitterness, the more anxiety or stress that we're going to build into our lives. You're right. And I'm telling you, it's, it's exhausting for me to fight against God. It's exhausting to get mad at people and allow my human nature to lead. It's exhausting. The human body and the human nature will exhaust you um, emotionally, physically. And I, you know, if you're exhausted and you're tired and you're anxious, um, then you haven't given it to God yet because there is a sense of relief and there is a sense of peace. Um, and that's how I know when I'm completely exhausted, I know that that I have been functioning from a human standpoint too much because when I'm resting in God and waking up and doing the daily thing, wherever God takes me, then it doesn't lead to that type of exhaustion because God doesn't, God doesn't call us to do things um, that are not in peace or are that, or that are not a heavy burden. There are pieces of that through the way, but an overall feeling of exhaustion because you're running up against that wall and you keep knocking yourself down, that's not from God. And that's how you know that you've gotten out of the God energy and into the human energy. Yep. So I just got to the point, I got tired of fighting it. <laughs> well, you know, it's um, one of the most interesting things in there that I found in my life when I'm mad at somebody or I'm frustrated or anything. Um, after giving it to God and then seeing kind of stepping back, they moved on. Right. They're not sitting over there stressing about it. They're not sitting out normally because right. if they're over there stressing about it and all that, then God's able to work and bring the relationship back together. Right. But when I have found that I'm just, I'm all about it and I'm this, that, and the other, and, and just want to continue the conflict, it, it does wear you out. Yes. Then when you're able to step back and give it to God, then mm -hmm. let God start working. Yes. Let him continue to work in you and let him work on the other person. Yes. But if you're constantly stirring the pot, God can't work. Yes. Well, and that was with my mom. You know, I kept running into that wall. Mom, we need to talk through this. Mom, we need to um, put our differences aside. Mom, we need to talk. We're mother and daughter. We need a relationship. We need to fix this. We need to blah, blah, blah. We need to blah, blah, blah. I kept running into that wall and I kept getting that rejection. And I kept telling myself, you just need to try harder. You just need to try longer. You just need to keep doing it. And I kept running into that wall. And God finally showed me, step back. I got this. And what I, what I felt from that was, 
you don't pull back on your love for her. You don't pull back on your kindness from her. But it's out of my control and out of my hands. I, as a human being, and what I can show or say to her is not going to penetrate through to her and make a difference. That's going to have to come from God. It is beyond my human capabilities to change her mind. And God showed me that. And God has also shown me that I have wrapped my arms around a sense of independence and more leaning on him now that my mom is out of the picture because she has such a dominating and domineering personality and she's very assertive and aggressive. I tend to go to her with everything and let her help me make decisions. And now I've learned because she has been removed from that part of my life that I go to God for those. And so I almost feel like God is working on both of us and that this distance is necessary right now. And that's, that's why I understand he's, he has shown me this distance is okay right now. There are things that need to be done that can only be created through this distance. And so I'm okay with it. But as long as I kept trying to change her mind and get her to see my point of view and running into that wall, it was killing me. It was crushing me. It was exhausting me. So the one thing you and said right really now is getting her to see your point of view. Right. And yes. God doesn't care about my point of view or your point of view because in the scheme of things, what he cares about is his point of view. <laughs> right. And his point exactly. of view is you forgive her or him or them, no matter what they've done, you forgive them the way Christ has forgiven you. Right. And that's a concept that's hard to wrap our mind. Now, that doesn't mean you have to run back into a relationship, right? You don't have right. to go back into something that's continuously hurting, but you do have to forgive. And that, that to me is always, that is my, I'm a class A personality. We've known each other enough. I, I'm a pusher. I, I right. doors closed, get out of the way knock it down <laughs> but that's not the way god wants us to do things right it's not a hey how far can you push this can you convince someone yeah i always, i try to tell myself in the back of my mind if i find myself trying to convince someone that i'm right and they're wrong i've lost the battle correct i'm, I'm at the wrong point of where i need to be right. in my relationship with god right exactly and and i dealt with that with my mom because when i left you know, there were several people in that company that I was very close to. And they would come to me and say, your mom said this about you. She said this about you. And it was all negative and it was all bad. And I started defending myself. And then it took me about a month. And then I was like, you know what? I'm done defending myself. I know who I am. God knows who I am. God knows what happened. I will no longer jump through those hoops and continue this negativity cycle. So I just let her say whatever she wants to say. I'm through defending myself. I won't even have those conversations anymore because I will not take part in that negativity and keeping that hate and again, negativity alive. So when I hear and when they come to me and say, she said this about you, she said that about you. And I'm just like, you know what? I'm not even dealing with that anymore. I know who I am. God knows who I am. I've moved on from that. I won't even take part in those conversations because it seems like God has put it on my spirit that I don't need to. So I don't. I'm not expending that energy on that because I think that is a lost cause at this moment. And there's so much, so many other people that need my energy to put, to be put into other places that are positive and that are building positive relationships and positive results and positive outcomes that I will not use this amount of energy that we're given each day on, on things like that anymore. So if they need to think that about me, I'm okay with it. There's just a piece about me that God has shown me. And he's like, I'm not saying it's not going to be, that it's going to be easy. And I'm not saying there's not going to be days that are hard. I'm just saying, it's okay. I got this. That's cool. Well, Teresa, thank you so much um, for joining me today and, and for sharing. Is there, um, kind of as we wrap up, any verse that has kind of been 
helpful to you that you cling through cling to uh, when you start thinking about what you've been through in your life? Yes, there is. I don't know what verse it is, but it's the joy of the Lord is my strength. And I'm not sure what verse that is, but do you know? I'm looking it up here. That is um, Nehemiah 810. Uh, I think, hold on, I think think that's it. Let's see. Um, You know how computers are when you need for them to work, right? (laughs) They they start... um, So there's a couple different ones here, but um, uh, yeah, Nehemiah 8.10, don't be dejected and sad for the joy of the Lord is your strength. And then Psalms 28.7 also says, the Lord is my strength and shield. I will trust him with all my heart. He helps me. My heart is filled with joy. I burst out in songs of thanksgiveness. Mine is the Nehemiah, and it's just I stop sometimes and I ask myself, just like with my mom, um, I'm I'm exhausted with that. And I think that if you're doing the right thing in God's eyes, then the joy of the Lord is my strength. So if I'm doing the right thing and bringing joy to the Lord from honoring him by following his word, then there is strength in that. And so when I get down about the mom thing, I'm like the joy, the joy of the Lord is my strength. If I'm doing the right thing and bringing joy to the Lord, he will give you strength in that. And I swear he does. It is a real thing. So I stop myself. Am I doing the right thing in God? If so, I can make it through this. I don't need to worry about what other people say about me, how they feel about me, because the joy of the Lord is my strength. I don't look for strength from people liking me or people approving of me. I try to be a good person, but the joy of the Lord is my strength. And that's what carries me through. And that is just so applicable to everything in my life right now. And I cling to that verse and it, and it works. You say it out loud over and over and you start to feel something transpire within you that gives you the strength to move on and peace. Many times a day you think you say that verse to yourself? A lot. I repeat it over and over and over. And it just, it, it um, changes how I feel. It changes chaos in my mind into peace and it changes exhaustion into content energy and um it it keeps me from needing the approval of the world and that is so important especially in social media times when everybody's posting how great their life is just look at just look at what you're doing is what you're doing bringing joy to the lord if it is that's your strength keep going Well, thank you so much for your, your time today. I thank you so much for, for opening up and sharing, um, especially things that are so personal. You know, we find um, in our Christian lives that it, it's easier just to tell someone, uh, oh, uh, you know, I'm, everything's great, or, you know, I'm having a bad day, or, or something didn't go right. Just kind of, we, we generalize, broad stroke, um, but it's, it's good to talk about. Right. Um, in a healthy way, not in a, oh, my way, oh, my wife, but, you know, like, hey, this is what I, you know, reaching others. This is what I went through, and this is how God is bringing me through it. Correct. And you don't see people wanting to be drawn to God from people who have perfect lives. What moves people is seeing you go through the valleys and the darkness and coming out and still being strong and impactful and helpful to the world. And so we've got to talk about you know, what the devil tells you to keep in the dark controls you. So bring it to the light. Do you know why having a perfect life, quote, does not bring people to God? Because they're not going, because one, the person doesn't have a perfect life. Right. But really, (laughs) when the person doesn't achieve that perfect life, then the thought immediately becomes, oh, God must not like me or right. I must not be godly enough or I'm not right. doing it right. I mean, it, right. It, it causes all this self-questioning. Correct. Absolutely. And Bring your testimony to light and let God work through you and let people see how God rescues you from it and leads you through all of this. And that's what draws people to God. And that's why we all have to be willing to talk about the dark that, and bring it to light. And use it as a testimony to bring people to God. And that's what I do with, and I've had plenty, (laughs) 
I've had, I've made enough mistakes that I've got great testimony. So I bet you uh, during the entire quarantine, no matter how long it uh, lasts, we could do a 24 um, seven recording. And I still probably couldn't tell you everything that I've done wrong in my life. <laughs> Me too. Me too. Um, you know, crying just from the age of accountability up through, I mean, college, my college years of four yes. years would, I mean, gosh, that would, um, we won't yes. even go there. Same here. I'm right there with you. So just take comfort in knowing that your trials and tribulations are what can bring people to God. If you'll talk about them and let him lead you through them and push you through them. It's, it's a, it's a great thing. It's a great opportunity for all the Christians. So take comfort in that and just yes. keep going. Keep going. Well, thank you yeah. so much for your time again, and um, you. appreciate you you coming on the Handling Life podcast and and sharing your story and giving some steps that people um, can, can you know, apply in their lives and you know really the the implementation side of going from knowing what God wants us to do to actually applying it and how do we integrate our faith and if you want to learn more about this podcast uh, about this ministry you can visit handlinglife.org. <laughs>